A context-dependent correlation gives you much more information than the simple correlation analyses we talked about last week. These kinds of correlations are also called psychophysiological interactions, as you may have seen them referred to in SPM. That's because they consist of both a psychological component and a physiological component. The psychological component refers to the condition that the subject is exposed to. It could be condition A, condition B, visual stimuli versus auditory stimuli, something like that. The physiological component refers to the actual observed neural data, or the bullet signal that we're getting in each voxel's time course. What we're interested in is, does the correlation change as a measure of what psychological condition the subject is exposed to? So it gives you a little bit more nuanced information. It gives you a little bit more of a more interesting story if you can do one. Now, I'm using this with the block design that we used in AFNI Data 6. So we've already run 3D Synthesize. We've already cleaned up the data. So refer to the tutorial on 3D Synthesize if you're unclear about how we've already done that. Also, be aware that psychophysiological interactions are usually better adapted, better suited, to factorial designs. In this case, we don't have a factorial design. We just have two conditions. They're not crossed in any way. But just be aware that that's usually a good idea if you are planning to do a context-dependent correlation ahead of time. So let's get started. Here I've copied a lot of stuff into a new directory called CDC. It stands for context-dependent correlation. Let me just clean up a little bit of stuff here. Okay. So here I have all the stuff that went into 3D Convolve for our original analysis. I also have the clean data that's been run through 3D Synthesize to remove effects of no interest, like trends and any kind of motion. All right, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to generate a region of interest. Now typically this should be something like an unbiased ROI, a peak voxel from another study maybe, or it could be an anatomical landmark. Here, this is going to be a biased ROI, so just spoiler alert, I wouldn't expect you to do this in real life, but we're just going to take our contrast of auditory, or sorry, of visual minus auditory. I'm going to bump this up a little bit here, and we are going to look in the visual cortex. Okay, down here. So we have a pretty nice healthy cluster right here going in the positive direction where visual is greater than auditory. I'm going to clusterize it, click on report, and that is indeed the cluster that I'm on right now. So auxiliary data set, I'm going to put this clean data in there, and I'm going to plot it just to see what it looks like average across an entire ROI. Looks good, looks kind of blocky like I'd expect, and I'm going to save that to a time course, clust 01 mean dot 1D. So first thing we're going to do after that is we're going to create an ideal response function. This is because we'll be using a command called 3DT fitter to perform deconvolution. So waiver, our time step was 2, a TR of 2 seconds. We're going to use a gamma impulse response basis function, and we're just going to plant one at the very first TR. Dump this into something called gamma hr.1d. And as always, just check your work just to make sure that it looks okay. It does indeed look like a gamma impulse response function, so we're okay. Next thing, we are, oh, I'm just going to change the name of this cluster just to make it a little bit more consistent with the stuff on Gong's webpage. Okay, I'm just renaming it seed time series.1d. So 3DT fitter. And this is the right hand of the equation, and this is the seed time series. We're going to run deconvolution with fall tongue, that's German for deconvolution, in case you're wondering. We're going to use the gamma basis function for deconvolution, and we're going to give it an output file name of seed neuronal data. Okay, essentially what we're doing, we're just teasing apart all the bold response from the actual neuronal data, because we're assuming that the actual observed time course response is a convolution of a basis function and the underlying data. So we're just removing that basis function that's been convolved to basically switch from bold time, like the, the bold lens that we see through, into the underlying neural activity. We're going to give it a penalty function. You can look these more in the 3D T fitter help, but right now I think these defaults will work fine for you. 
it's doing a bunch of different penalty functions to find the ideal one. Okay, so that's generated seed underscore N-E-U-R. So we're going to look at that through 1D plot. Just make sure it, you know, nothing got too out of whack. It still looks roughly like it did before. We just removed the convolution component with the basis function. Okay. Another step, which I've already done here, is this creating this a versus b coding dot 1D. All I've done is across all of the different runs, I've made it negative one where there's been an auditory stimulus presented. Remember, this is a block design. And it's for 20 seconds that each of these were presented. So for auditory, that's for 20 seconds, so 10 TRs of negative one. There was a baseline rest of zero. So we're, we just code the baseline as zero. That lasted for 10 seconds or five TRs, so five entries of zero. And then another list of auditory stimuli. And then positive one refers to when the visual stimuli was presented. Okay, so it just keeps on going like that until the very end for 450 time points. Okay, so we're going to take the interaction between that A versus B coding, which is, which is our psychological component, and the seed underscore neural dot 1D, which is a physiological component, removing any effects of convolution with the HRF. So we're simply going to just multiply these two together. So seed neuronal and A versus B coding, those are our variables, and the expression is going to be A times B. We're going to dump this into something called inter NEU, which stands for neuronal.1D. Okay, again, always look at these steps if you've done them. Okay. Let's see here. Hold up, everybody. Okay, the one thing I forgot to do, I'm going to do 1D transpose. I would normally redo this, but I'm already pretty deep into it. I feel like I got a good groove going, so I'm just going to kind of gloss over that. 1D transpose seed, and you are. Or you know what? We don't need to do 1D transpose. You could do that if you're a newbie. Or you could do this slash apostrophe, which is uh, transpose. All right, so now we just take a look at that. Okay, it looks like we have deflections from zero in both positive and negative directions, which is what we'd expect from that one, zero, negative one weighting. So looks good, looks reasonable. And now we have our interaction term. However, we gotta convert that back from the actual underlying neural response, convolve it back with a bold response so we can enter it into our GLM. So waiver, gam, we'll give it a peak of one. TR is going to be two and the input is that recently produced interaction of their neuronal data. Uh, num out, that just puts a limit, an upper limit on the number of TRs, which is 450, which is our total time in TRs. And we're gonna call this the interaction time series dot 1D. Cool, so we have that. Let's take a look at it. All it's done is convolved. All of those time points with the bold response. Looks decent, looks pretty good. And now all we got to do is put that stuff that we've just created into 3D deconvolve. So here's what it looks like. I've already set this up in decon.sh. It's pretty much the same as what we had in AFNI underscore data six, if you did that tutorial. Pretty much the same thing, only now we've added a couple stem files. Okay. Importantly, remember to remove the stem base because we're not putting this into a baseline model. Okay, we're just putting these without convolving them into the GLM, right? Because we have one value per TR, we're not convolving it with like a, a block a basis function or a gamma basis function. We're just entering them as is into the model. So both the seed time series and the interaction time series. This will account for any residual forms of variance. And what we're interested in is what loads onto this interaction term right here. Okay. I could probably get rid of this GLT sim, I don't really need it anymore. But we have all that, and we have bucket stats. I'm going to add something like interaction, so I don't overwrite the statistics data sets that's already there. And if you want, you can also output the R squared for each of these. Importantly, the R squared for this interaction term. Now, I have it on good authority, by which I mean Gung's homepage, that it actually works just as well, if not better, 
if you instead take the beta weights estimated for the interaction term to a second level instead of the R squared values. Okay. It's just it's extra steps for the R squared to convert it to the actual R value and then do our R to Z transform, which I'm not going to go through. Uh, we already covered the R to Z transform in the last tutorial. So that's the decon, deconvolution script. We are now going to run that, and it's going to give us essentially all the same beta estimates, you know, very similar beta estimates for the actual regressors of interest, but we're also adding in an estimate for the beta for our interaction term. As this is running, I'm also going to tell you that when you do a psychophysiological interaction or context-dependent correlation, what you used as the seed region typically should not show up in this interaction term. The reason for that is because we're interested not just in what other voxels correlate with that time series, but under what condition it correlates. So, in the, in the case that we have this voxel or this ROI that's perfectly correlated with itself, it doesn't really matter what condition it's in, so it's really not going to load on that interaction term, which is sensible, I hope. I should also mention I have no a priori hypothesis for what this psychophysiological interaction should look like. I'm just using available data for convenience. And most likely the results aren't really going to make sense. We're just going through the methods and the steps right now. So that's all taken care of. It ran through. Today is apparently the anniversary of the Battle of Thermopylae. And we are going to overlay the stats interaction on here. And importantly, we're going to look at this interaction time series. Maybe I'll underlay the coefficient right here. Yeah, okay. So again, really, I don't really know what to expect from doing this. I'm just using data of convenience. But here we have a somewhat interesting map. But any voxels which seem to load heavily on this let me just clean this up a little bit, means that the correlation between the seed region and any of these voxels is dependent or at least influenced by what psychological condition the subjects are in. The interpretation can be a little complex. It usually helps if you have some sort of a priori hypothesis going in, but this is essentially the nuts and bolts of doing a psychological... Let me try that one more time. A psychophysiological interaction or context dependent correlation, just to, to please everybody. I hope that helps. Again, I'll try to be fleshing more of this out in the blog post down below. And please, if you have any questions, feel free to. <laughs> I hesitate to say ask me. I don't want everybody to ask me, but you can you can ask me. It's okay. <laughs>